Good afternoon and very welcome to SNS and this seminar during which we will discuss the current progress uh, being made within the field of artificial intelligence. And we will dive into the potential effects on the labor market, how corporations and other organizations deal with this intensified AI race. And of course, we will also discuss the risks with and the regulations of AI. We have invited three speakers, Jörg Gretz, Joachim Wernberg and Sara Örvall, to share their insights with us today. And we will start off with Georg, who will be, present an overview of what research can tell us about the impacts of AI on the labor market. After that, Joachim and Sara will join us here on stage for a broader discussion. And of course, at always, as always at SNS, uh, you are all very much encouraged by me to contribute to the discussion with your questions and reflections. If you want to share what is said on social media, you are very welcome to use our hashtag SNS Kunskap. My name is Ilinka Benson. I am CEO here at SNS and I will moderate this discussion. And Jörg, you can uh, stand up here, so I will introduce you. Uh, you are Associate Professor of Economics at Uppsala University, and you have lot, done a lot of work, um, research on the impact of uh, technological development on labor market and also education economics. And you are one of the co-authors of this year's SNS Economic Policy Council report, Konjunkturrådsrapport 2023. Uh, strukturomvandling på svensk arbetsmarknad, konsekvenser och policyåtgärder. And if you want to, you can take a copy of this uh, outside. And um, yes, with that, I leave the floor to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Very happy to be here to discuss this exciting, also difficult topic. Uh, the premise is that AI is changing the labor market. We wonder... Um, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Is it going too fast? But let me start with a, with a broader perspective and some, some general observations on structural change. So in modern capitalist economies, labor markets are in constant flux. This is because of forces such as technological progress, also uh, perhaps increased openness to trade, um, that lead to job creation, job destruction, employment shifting across sectors, across occupations. And when that process works well, that is in fact, in fact largely a good thing. In fact, it is a precondition um, for economies to grow, to become more productive and to deliver rising living standards. Um, but of course, there can be distributional effects. So there can be not only winners, but also losers. And so for this process to be widely accepted, um, it is important that there are institutions, policies in place that help societies uh, cope with the disruptive um, aspects of these processes. And uh, as, as Ilinka has mentioned, um, my co-authors and I have, have talked about the process of structural change in Sweden over the past 40 years uh, in, in the latest uh, SNS Economic Policy Council report. And there we conclude that it has been working quite well in Sweden. So we look at the anatomy, how does structural change actually look like in the Swedish case. Uh, we, we try to identify who, who is most at risk of losing out from it and and we discuss the the policies that that are in place and and how how to make them better but overall we we conclude that, that the swedish experience is quite a positive one now whenever a new technology arrives um the question excuse me the question arises is this time different so even though we might have managed in the past um to largely uh, um, you know, gain from technological process progress. It might be that now things are just moving too fast, and 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 now uh, things might be different. And this is a common theme. Uh, this is not new. So I've been following this 
such discussions now for maybe 15 years and and uh, this, this question is this time different it's like every year in connection to some new technology um, but anyway I think we all agree that uh, that recent AI based applications are indeed impressive um, and especially in the last half year there is quite quite a drastic change I think if I remember back to maybe five years ago when we talked about machine learning, we were trying to think, trying to characterize it, what does it do, what, what is it really that it is good at, and often the conclusion was it's good at prediction, some sort of prediction classification. Um, and, and that's now from, from the point of view of, of, of having seen these large language models and what some foundation models, that seems to be quite a narrow characterization actually. So, uh, you know, this, this function of prediction, it started out with something like image recognition, speech recognition, um, perhaps there's applications in medical diagnosis, also in, in things like driverless cars and in manufacturing, of course. Um, but it seems like now this has been taken a step further by building algorithms that are very good at predicting, say, the next word. And not just based on the last five words or something like you have on your phone, but maybe on the past like 2000 words or something like that. And that seems to be a, a drastic change. And of course, it's not just applied to language, but also to, to image generation, to, to video and, and even music generation. So these, these applications are spreading very fast. And that, um, especially if, if you... Uh, compare it to uh, um, previous technologies such as personal computers or the internet that diffused at a much lower speed. And this in itself would be worrying because workers and policymakers need time to adjust. Um, so that's why I think the, you know, it's exactly the right question that, that we are asking that, that uh, the title of this seminar is asking, is it going too fast? However, it's not clear yet that the impact is mostly negative. If the impact is mostly positive, then, you know, let's, let's have this amazing new technology as fast as we can. And then, of course, beyond the labor market, there are broader worries about AI uh, issues related to alignment and safety that I will uh, come back to towards the end, but I will mostly talk about the labor market. So what is the labor market impact of AI? As economists, we like to think about new technologies in terms of their potential to replace or augment uh, human labor. So augmenting meaning making uh, people better at their jobs. And I think we, we can all agree based on our experience of the past couple of months that AI in, indeed is already helping many people to do their jobs better and faster. Um, so that in itself is a good thing. There is um, the demand side to worry about in this, in this um, context as well. So if you're better at something, it means you can make it as a, at, a, at a lower cost through competition that will drive down prices. And, and then the question is, how much more demand will there be? How much, how much will demand respond to lower prices? And in some cases, the, the response can be quite small. And that is why, for instance, um, the agricultural sector today is very small because the demand for calories is relatively um, inelastic. But, so that's one thing to consider whenever you're wondering, let's say, take journalism, uh, they get so much better, but is there so much more demand for, for, for reading articles? That's an important question to ask. Um, but then the other issue, of course, is that uh, there could be direct replacement. It might be that, that um, many people are just that go or many positions are not filled again because, because AI can take over most of what people do. So th that's sort of the basic tension between replacing and augmenting. Of course, when a new technology arrives, there is always also going to be new jobs created uh, already directly in relation to the technology, in relation to implementing that technology. And we can already see that if we look at uh, uh, descriptions of, of sort of job ads, um, texts in job ads. Uh, we can already see that AI skills are required more and more, especially as you might expect, 
among IT specialists, but also other engineers, mathematicians, researchers. Um, on the other side, people have started looking at what are the occupations that are actually affected um, by, in particular, large language models. Um, and some recent research has looked at descriptions of occupations. What is it? What is the content of these occupations? What do people do at their, in their jobs? And, and then try to assess uh, what's the scope for something like ChatGPT or other, other LLM-based apps um, to, to replace some of, of those tasks. And then what, what people found here is, is really uh, new. I mean, you know, this list of, of um, occupations, interpreters, writers, writers, public relations specialists, uh, this would not have been on the list of, of occupations potentially affected by new technologies, let's say, 10 years ago. So there's clearly a new direction here. It's not easy, though, to, to understand what being affected means. So um, the OECD has conducted a lot of, actually dozens of, almost 100 case studies, um, talking to workers, talking to managers, and uh, uh, where, where AI was introduced into the workplace. And in many cases, it actually meant augmentation, that people were getting better at, at, at their jobs rather than being replaced. This is, of course, early days in terms of the research and in terms of the implementation. Um, so the overall effect, of course, we cannot know yet. Uh, one thing that is very interesting that seems to be emerging in this early research is that perhaps AI can actually have a role in uh, lowering labor market inequality in leveling the playing field. So here is an example where occupations are put on a space where the wage is on the horizontal axis and um, the the exposure to to GPTs, according to a human assessment, is on the vertical axis. And uh, what you see is that it is actually higher wage occupations that have the most exposure. And in related work, so people are starting to look at how does AI actually af affect individuals' productivity. So here's an example from uh, from a, a, a customer support firm where I, th I think it's a business to business operation where where customers ask questions through a chat and on the other side of the chat so working at this customer support firm it's it's humans that are supposed to to respond and to resolve the issues and in this firm gradually introduced um, GPT based applications to suggest to the to the human respondents what an answer might be to a given query from a customer. And here you see the effect of using this AI aid on, um, on resolutions per hour, so how, how fast you can deal with the queries. And what's striking is that the largest effect really is at the, uh, at the lower end in terms of people's skills. So there's almost or there is actually a precisely zero, precisely estimated zero effect on the highest skilled uh, workers. This really seems to be helping um, the least skilled ones. Uh, and this is in this field uh, of, you know, how does technology affect the labor market for me is like completely new. I've never seen something like this before. In the past 15, 20, 30 years, we've always been talking about skill bias technological change, that technology helps the skilled workers the most inequality will increase. If this is a um, sort of consistent pattern, this this is would be really striking and and probably largely good news. Okay, so let me um, let me comment on sort of the the broader macroeconomic picture as well. Um, I don't think we are yet at the point where we have superhuman AI. So it's impressive, but it's it's not there yet in terms of outdoing us at, at everything. But let's say for a moment that uh, we have this, maybe a, you know a few iterations of 
of GPT down the road. Let's say we have superhuman AI. Well, what that would mean is that we get dramatic productivity improvements. And that's good because even our very wealthy, in parts at least, world is still ruled by scarcity. So we have shortages in healthcare, waiting times. If you're a parent, you worry about what school you, you send your kids to uh, because there's so much differences and such a scarcity of high quality schools. Wouldn't it be great if or it didn't matter where you go to because all the schools are great, aided by AI. Um, and, and we are starting to see this, of course, in the education sector already, that these tools can be very beneficial. So again, it goes on if you think about things like climate change, more generally damage to the natural environment. Um, these problems will require technological solutions. So we should welcome uh, progress uh, on this front. And of course, uh, large parts of the world are still very poor. So then the question is, okay, suppose we have these, these super productive technologies, can we then have mass unemployment at the same time? Yeah, it could be because everything is done by technology, but that wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing. Okay, so the, the unlikely scenarios where things really go badly would be where resources are distributed extremely unequally where there's like a small group of people that controls these technologies and that keeps everyone else from enjoying them. And maybe that's unlikely. Also remember that many of us value human work intrinsically. So we might value a human cooking us a meal or um, uh, painting something or perform performing a, a piece of music. And to the extent that this remains true, there will always be some human work. And especially if you think about a lot of personal services. So then if I seem sort of optimistic maybe on, on these points, what would be the remaining worries? Well, it's these other issues. So um, related to AI safety, which is that humans might abuse AI. Uh, for destructive uses. Um, and then the other worry that AI might turn against humans. Lots of people are talking about this now and lots of knowledgeable people actually think that is a serious possibility. So it's, 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 uh, it's good to think about that. Um, so then finally, what, what are my policy recommendations? Um, in terms of the labor market, as, as we discussed in the report, the Swedish policy mix is a good example for dealing with structural change in general. Um, we maybe have some issues there with how well targeted the policies are, but in general, it's a very good example. Um, now, though, we face this, uh, this high speed of, of, of deployment. And so public agencies such as the Public Employment Service and so on should develop scenarios for what if there are large adverse impacts? What if um, driverless cars hit the road at scale and, and most of human drivers are replaced within a short period. And we should also think about, of course, um, the education system, updating the curriculum. What should we be focused on? Should we still study math and languages? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe there should be more focus as well on, on interactive skills, on personal services, crafts, arts, and so on. I don't have sort of firm views on this, but I think these are the, the questions that we should, we should be asking. One thing to keep in mind is that um, as societies, we can choose to keep humans in charge in, in many cases, and uh, this may buy us time. So for instance, we might uh, mandate by law that, uh, that a bus um, uh, has to be attended by a, by a human. Um, whether or not it could actually drive by itself. And this is something that is already common. Uh, if, if you look at um, professions such as lawyers and doctors, where there's a lot of gatekeeping, where there's a lot of rules, or oh, only this particular person with this particular certification is allowed to do a given task, even though the task in many cases might be quite simple. So on AI safety and alignment, I think it's a super difficult topic. I'm not an expert on that, it would seem to be a very difficult and a new area for regulators. So 
there needs there is going to be lots of learning um i think as always as an as an economist that's sort of my job um discussions should really be focused on the details so okay so what's on the table what are we proposing okay what's the idea here how does that work if you look at people's incentives and so on there was this idea that we should have a pause i'm not sure what that will do if we don't also have a clear plan what happens during this pause and another thing that that people are um, suggesting these days is that that may be a, a useful parallel is how we regulated or tried to regulate uh, nuclear technology, both for, for peaceful use and, and for weapons. And maybe there is lessons to be learned there. So I think that's something that, that we should be thinking about, but I don't have any firm recommendations at this point. Thank you very much, Jor, and an applaud for Jor, who will now move there. And um, I would like to welcome Sara Örval and Joachim Wernberg up on stage. You can pick and choose whichever table you want. Joachim Wernberg is Associate Professor at the Department of Technology, Technology and Society at Lunds University. And you also coordinate a newly started um, interdisciplinary research group for socioeconomic technology studies Long called name, right? SOTEC. Uh, and uh, uh, apart from that, you're also a research leader at Entrepreneurscops Forum, where you also focus on digitalization and technology. And Sara Örval, uh, you're a senior advisor at Axel Jonsson and uh, among other um, uh, positions, a board member of Axfood, Bonnier Books, Investor and SNS. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're specialized since long uh, on promoting digital change within the business sector, and also the author of a book that I can highly recommend, uh, Your Future Self, How New Technologies Are Revolutionizing Humans and Making Us Stronger, Smarter and Kinder. So a very warm welcome to both of you. And during this panel discussion, I would like to cover three broad topics. So first of all, though, the impact on the labor market. Secondly, how we manage the risks and what the needs for regulations there are. And finally, but uh, very important, how businesses and other organizations are dealing with this um, uh, development. And since we have already heard uh, your setting the scene for the labor market impacts, I would now like to give the word to Joachim and Sara, respectively, to, to set the scene for a couple of minutes for the two other topics. So let's start with you, you Joachim. There are now a lot of initiatives to regulate AI being drafted both in the EU and in other parts of the world. And it would be very interesting if you could briefly tell us about um, the different regulation approaches taken and um, by the EU, US and China, respectively. Please. Sure thing. And thanks for the invitation. Uh, so I would like to start by taking a step back because the intense debate that we've been having since basically rising since January because of chat GPT and now this letter for a pause on AI have muddied the waters because we are mixing and matching different types of technologies. So AI going back to the 1950s has been a a term for a lot of different research strands and technologies within academia. And what is and isn't AI has shifted over time as it does in the academic environment. Some stuff go out because it doesn't, it doesn't pan out. And some stuff comes in like machine learning, which was a minimal part at first. So AI has changed in the academic setting since 1950s. So it's a new technology, but with an old name. This, this gives us the first mis misinterpretation because we think this has been around for ages. So it's highly time to regulate it now. The second part is that when you translate an academic term like that to politics, stuff gets weird because there are, there are many, many different types of AI, but let me, let me describe three of them. So the AI we have today is what we would call narrow AI. So we train it on a specific task where it can perform very, very well based on, on uh, large amounts of data. ChatGPT goes into this category. It's still narrow AI. The second category, and this, this type of AI is extremely powerful, but it's also very limited. The second type, which is what everyone's striving to achieve now, is artificial general intelligence, which is AI that could, based on training data within two domains, apply itself to a third domain, which is not trained for. 
So this is what people are looking at at GPT-4, for instance, today and saying, is it learning stuff that wasn't in the training data? The answer to that is inconclusive. We can see some patterns. But first, we don't know what the training data for the GPT engines look like. So we can't determine. If we knew, we would know much more for this type of debate. But apart from that, the whole point with AI, narrow AI and AGI, is to find patterns in data that we couldn't find and to, to extrapolate on those in a way that creates economic value. So AGI is, is the holy grail here. That's what we want to achieve. Apart from that, we also have super intelligence. And there are researchers, uh, some philosophers, some, some of other disciplines that are looking into the risks of what if this AI becomes sentient? Because we don't know what conscience is. So if we don't know that, could it appear within the machine? When we see this debate we're having today, we're mixing these two extremes. So we're talking about AI that has its own agency and takes control over society. And at the same time, we're regulating narrow AI. I think that's disastrous. So the first thing we need to do is to separate these three categories because they're, they're associated with their own risks. So narrow AI is not risk-free. That's not what I'm saying. We need to focus on the risks that are associated with this type of technology. For instance, if there's bias in the data, you can get different types of, of sexist behavior or racist behavior in an algorithm because it, it finds that pattern in the data and it extrapolates it into the future when you ask it to do something. The difference between that and, and the people that showed these biases in the training data that created the training data is that AI is applied on a much larger scale. So it's a new type of risk. So we need to look at that. AGI has its own type of risks as well, because that goes into a sort of uncertainty territory. If we don't know what domains a new technology could be applied to, we need to think differently about such things as market failure. Superintelligence, on the other hand, requires us to, to talk about the Terminator scenario and stuff like that. Those risks are always associate, associated with independent agency and the fact that we can't turn the technology off. We need to talk about them, absolutely, but let's do that in a different room, in a different building than the one where we're talking about today's AI. So how are we then regulating AI? Well, first of all, we are mixing these different concepts. So if we look at the OECD, the EU, uh, Statistics Sweden, and there's a third source, a fourth, I can't remember it now. They're using different, different definitions of AI when they gather statistics, which we use to make decisions. When they frame the regulatory debate within the EU and the OECD, they're using different definitions of what AI is, which implies unnecessary uh, regulatory burden for everyone who wants to use AI. And that's a big issue. What we're doing in the EU is something called horizontal regulation. So we're trying to, we're trying to find the common denominators for all AI today and hopefully tomorrow as well. Uh, and we're trying to set the rules for that as if it was unregulated to begin with. It was not. Uh, so this, what we're doing is we are preventing fragmentation of the internal market because otherwise individual member countries might regulate on their own for different types of AI applications. So that's a good thing. The bad thing is that we are ex ante, prior to anyone actually using large language models on a large scale within a company, we have to figure out what the rules should be for that market to function. And we're doing that without regard to the underlying rules, sector by sector. In the US, on the other hand, they, they, um, they've been blamed for being less fair on AI. I'd say that's not less fair. What they're doing is they're saying the regulation within each sector has to be taken into consideration. So when we figure out where we need to regulate AI, we first look at the regulation that's in place and then we try to find a market failure. That's a good thing. The EU has just pushed this, this homework for the future. So when we implement the AI Act, we're going to have to do exactly what the, the US is doing now. On the bad side for the US, they are, uh, they are getting heavily regulated on a state-by-state -state level. So they are fragmenting their own market as we speak. And then third, we have China. Uh, they are, if something, not fragmented, uh, but very centralized. The issue, and I don't know very much, China is a bit out of my, my territory uh, of expertise, but something that's very interesting with the Chinese example, because as Georg mentioned, we have this alignment problem. We want the machine to be aligned with the values we want to project onto the market. 
China is, is doing this in a very, very uh, interesting way because their alignment problem is that a large language model cannot say something that is goes against good socialist values, for instance. So this should be a mirror back to us when we talk about alignment problems, because perhaps aligning to 100% with values that the people in this room might agree to is going to be extremely hard as soon as we move outside the building, because alignment is very individual and very heterogeneic uh, when it boils down to, to actual use. Uh, so those are some thoughts on the issues we are facing right now in regulation. Thank you very much, Joachim. And now to you, Sara, you have sort of your hands in the dirt and, and working a lot with both boards and executive management on, on how to, to cope with this development. It would be very interesting to hear your reflections. Thank you. Interesting, though, that it's the dirt in the oh. bottom. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, um, couldn't resist that one. So yeah, the, the topic of this seminar is, is are we moving too fast with AI? And I think without sort of putting my own opinion into it, we can for sure say we're moving much faster than with previous technology shifts, as both of you have pointed to. And I think it's important to remember why. Like we have a technology now that for the first time is so easy to implement. So for any corporation who's gone through like a new ERP system or pushing through SAP, installation we know sort of the frustration the cost the complicated process this is nothing like it it's something you can start download and, and kick off immediately and, and that changes a lot not only in investment but also in speed secondly the way you use this system is not a way where you need computer or data scientist to teach you across the company but any department can start to explore quite quickly. Doesn't mean that they learn how to use them in the best way quickly, but they can start quickly. And that sort of pushes the or accelerates the speed. And then also at the same time, we have a situation where the computer, computational cost is decreasing. We have cloud availability and the cost of sensors is, are going down. So it also means that the cost is overall much uh, more attractive for most companies. So that means we see a fast acceleration. And there are some studies IBM tested or asked across Europe and the US, and they concluded that 35% of large companies have now installed AI system in one way or the other that's meaningful. McKinsey did the same study, they, they concluded 50%, so it should be somewhere in between probably. Uh, on average, these companies has, have 3.8 applications. Now, I think what's important is to sort of look at beneath that, what is it that we're doing in companies? And, and I think there are three areas where, where at least I see a lot of activity, where the first is quite naturally business intelligence, like connecting all these data silos into some kind of view where you for the first time really can make use of all of your data in the company, almost like becoming super intelligent as a manager seeing like where are these inefficiencies we have, where are the profit pools we've ignored and, and creating this sort of smartness for the company. And, and that's for the first time much easier. And that also means that companies that are at the forefront will create a gap to the ones who are operating more or less blindly without these systems. And secondly, there is a lot of activity going on in administrative processes. So already we have insurance companies who are automating the claims, like if you have an auto or house damage, you can just send your pictures and then through computer vision technology, uh, that can be evaluated. Or uh, we have banks here. <laughs> banks, we read today, are using AI systems that, that can detect fraud and money laundry, et cetera. But also, uh, I think the more sort of creative processes that both of you talked about as well, and, and that's what's new now with this technology, that we don't maybe need as many illustrators, copywriters, um, all these sort of professions where we thought humans would be more unique. And since this is so easy to implement, this is not happening in two years or three years. It's happening now. And that has consequences because these systems can be applied and used uh, as we speak. Mm. So I think in terms of impact, 
we will see things happening quite quickly in companies. And obviously at the same time, if we talk about the labor market, new professions will open up. There will be uh, prompters that we didn't have in companies before. The best ones to, to use the system, ask smart questions to them. There will be new AI strategies needed uh, at the, on the top level to guide companies. And I think to, to sum up and, and end where, where you ended also with the, the value alignment problem, that's probably the area where I would be most concerned from, from a corporate point of view that we have boards and executive management teams where the AI competence is not very high, uh, thereby the understanding of this system is not as good as it should be. So when we have exactly as you say with these narrow AI systems that we are implementing today, if we do that at speed, and we don't understand the, the values or lack of value evaluations hidden in these systems, we may end up with, a, for example, um, a customer service system that guides our customers in a way we would never do if we would write the advice. Or we would end up with ways of treating even our own employees in ways we shouldn't do. Because we do not, on a management level, understand how the data is processed by the large language model. And that is something that's very important to discuss. <laughs> Ideally, we would agree on at least some kind of basic values, but if not, at least understanding the impact of it. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So I would like to open the floor for, for questions and reflections. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for a microphone and um, yeah, say who you are. And Thank you. You and your views from SCB. Uh, my question regards to the, the speed that this is happening, uh, which which you've all been been uh, talking about. How will the labor market in the Western countries uh, basically cope with this dramatic change? Because uh, personally, I see a very large risk of a lot of jobs being replaced. Uh, perhaps not in the very early stages, but uh, in not so long into the future and, and uh, it to me it's it's a huge risk for our system uh, for the whole economy so it, to all of you basically yes. you want to start you Joachim and then you Sara and then Yuri <laughs> or you start you Joachim and then okay. Sara and then Yuri <laughs> I'm going to try to be a devil's advocate here and say that uh, the thing that's moving fast is not the change in the labor market there's a big difference when we talk about, and here you brought this up with, with the comparison with the personal computers and the internet. The thing is, these are cumulative technologies. We tend to forget that there is no, there is not going to be any AI if you don't digitize your business. And, and a lot of businesses are not at the forefront of, of digital transformation, to speak lightly about it. Um, what we're seeing is improved user interfaces. So so let's go back to 97 when internet started spreading. In order to build a web page in 97 you would need to be a technical expert by 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 the standards of that time. You would qualify into being a programmer having to write html uh, and it would take quite some time. Today you can do it in 2 minutes and you don't need to know anything about what goes on in the back end as long as you just want a basic web page. So the difference here is cumulative technology. So AI is building upon the technology we've already adopted. If we haven't adopted it, we can't use AI. Second, we're not implementing it in businesses in full scale. In Sweden, I think there's five, it, it, it increased with the latest measurement. Again, they're using their own definition of intelligent systems, but somewhere between five and 10%, right? What's the latest? Mm, depends on how you count and per industry, but okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. It's it was 5.4%, oh, so it's quite yeah. a small number. Uh, the biggest issue here in the labor market, I think, is first, there's going to be a divide between how people are using this technology because you and I can start using ChatGPT right now, just as we can build a web page in two minutes. But our employers tend not to have implemented it in their way of thinking. It's not in the boardroom. It's not in the executive suite. So because of that, you're going to have unintended consequences because you and I are going to use it just as we use Gmail to send stuff home or, or we use Dropbox because it's efficient, but it's not implemented on a corporate level. That's going to be a big issue, I think. The second issue is because it's not implemented at the top level, 
And middle management is going to be be uh, in the cross eyes of that problem because they're going to have to answer both the top level and to employees who want to use ChatGPT and other large language models. Uh, the second part here is because it's not at the top level, we're not going to get the productivity gains out of the technology unless we reorganize work, both within the individual firms and in the labor market as such. The biggest thing here, I think we'll definitely have prompting as a skill uh, in, in some intermediary phase. The big question here is what type of tasks were unfeasible for us to do in the economy yesterday and became feasible today? So for instance, if we want to try out a million combinations, I will have to hire quite a lot of people to try out those combinations of drugs or um, good ways of building a digital service or, or good copy text or what have you. Um, that would be unfeasible. It's too expensive. But if I can use a large language model to do it, if I can use an AI to do it, it becomes feasible. And we need that change at the top level in order to be able to leverage the technology for more than just substitution of individual tasks. Thank you. Sara, would you like to... No, just on? quickly, but I, I kind of disagree. <laughs> Good. <laughs> and agree. No, I agree sort of overall. But then again, I mean... I think still it hasn't been on the boardroom level or executive management level, but it certainly is. Since the launch of the chat GPT, something happened in most companies. So mm -hmm. I think, and then again, you're right, it takes time to, to, to install and implement. But the surprising thing, I think, and, and I think there I would agree to your question that there are a number of processes within each company that I would define more like supportive processes. Like in all big companies, we have a lot of administrative roles. Those will be quite quick to, to yeah. automate. And there will be such important economic gains from it that I, I have a hard time seeing why you would not push that development. And that could move quite fast. Um, so I think, yes, overall, it will take time, particularly when we look at the product development process, installing AI in all products and services, because there most companies have very solid product development processes that they take time and should take time because you want to test and you want to make sure the systems are secure. But in those more sort of light administration, uh, administrative areas, I would be more concerned because there you have substitutional technologies. They will perform instead of the humans, not supporting the humans. So my, I, am, I would be a little bit more worried that we short term have problems with people who, who don't fit. And if you look at, uh, final comment, mm -hmm. if you look at the AI, um, the companies who are furthest ahead in AI development, they now reskill more than 50% of the people that work with AI because of that. They see so many people falling out of the sort of the, losing their existing tasks and therefore they need to reskill them. But if they don't, those and will be left in the sort of without work. So, so it is there's a lot of responsibility for each company, I think, to, to help these people to transform. I would like to let uh, Yorin yes. and and I would like to Yorin, if you also could uh, tie into to your uh, question uh, uh, during your speak with can AI driving mass unemployment and scarcity coexist because this is what we're talking of mm -hmm. because in almost every seminar we have here at SNS it can be education it can be care it can be public procurement it's always uh, the recurring theme is lack of labor and lack of skills. And at the same time, we're not now very worried about mass unemployment. So from a labor economist, what, what should be done in order not to, to uh, come to this situation? Yeah, so of course the challenge is that if things are speeding up, then this process that usually works well that labor reallocates, it, it might not work anymore because things are just happening too fast. And this is something where... Yeah, we need some awareness, some planning, the different parties, uh, the, the unions, the employers associations, the government should probably get together and talk through some scenarios, talk through some agreements probably that, that could be made to maybe slow down things a little bit here and there. But uh, to Ilinka's question, exactly. So there is shortages. Um, we have the, the highest number of highly educated people these days in history. Many of them potentially uh, able to work in healthcare, to work as doctors, but it's not necessarily getting more popular. We know that a lot of people are getting burned out also because of the pandemic, but in general, healthcare systems aren't 
in such great shape. So one question for policymakers is, why isn't there reallocation of work into those areas where we need them? So what prevents us from training, retraining people to be teachers, for instance? Is it that it is just an unattractive occupation? Well, if that's the case, can we maybe pay people more? If there is these huge productivity gains, will that not translate into higher taxes? Can we use these taxes to uh, retrain people, make those occupations, professions more attractive where there is there is a current shortage? So, yeah, exactly as Ilinka was saying, it's it's a bit hard to see how these all of these problems could coexist until we're like really stupid about about policy. So, and um, a related question that you were talking about a bit about it, Sara, and I think you also, uh, you were thinking that there will also be an increasing divide between firms and organizations if you also want to talk about the public sector, which is very important, about how good you are at implementing and using AI. So, what is your kind of advice on, on the firm or organization level? What is most important to do in order to benefit from, from this development? Sara, would you like to start? Well, I guess the obvious answer is, is skill building. Um, and, and that also prevents some of these problems with trans, um, you know, automating processes. So definitely that would be the starting point to understand sort of how do we make sure the most of our people are qualified for this new task. But but I do think it, it's a matter of, of looking strategically at these technologies and understand again how can we be smarter using them how can we have processes that are more efficient and thirdly how will each and product and service we deliver change because we infuse this technology into them and once we see that picture we need to make a long-term plan in terms of how do we then transform processes and people and and i think to be honest that most companies lack that roadmap today for natural reasons because we ha didn't have enough information about the power of the technologies but now we do enough to make that plan Joachim, would you like to i'd i'd also say skill uh but i would i would twist it a bit to the asymmetry between skill as in experience knowing the application domain where ai is going to be used and knowing the technology um going back to the 1950s there was a, a shortage of programmers in the usa uh, programmer was a completely different thing back then. But they had all of these massive programs to teach people how to code and, and to work with computers. And you still had the divide between uh, the supply of these skills and, and the demand in the labor market. So they asked the companies, look, why are you not happy? We've, we've educated all these programmers. And uh, they had a committee, and I think it was an executive in IBM who said, look, we've realized that a good programmer can be excellent. But a bad programmer is dismal. They're, they're just, they know how to program, but what we are actually looking for are problem solvers, people who can work more with, with the types of ideals, complex communication, uh, formulating problems, moving one step ahead from, from the beaten path. And, and you can't educate that on a massive scale. That requires a, a structural change in the educational system. So I think the complete, we need to bridge this asymmetry between understanding and having ex experience in the application domain and understanding how to use these technologies doesn't mean everyone needs to know all about AI. But if we can bridge that, for instance, by pairing technical startups with, with the public sector organizations through innovation competitions or, or what have you, we need to fix that gap. Thank you. There's a question over there. Yes, uh, <clears throat> Anders Schlotström retired uh, so on the... I'm listening uh, to you. Will we be able to measure AI as we measure human intelligence? Uh, I mean, it's got. Uh, will that be a possibility? I mean, you showed that uh, if you were more intelligent human, you had less use of AI uh, in in one of the fig first figures. So, so that's the first question. Second question: I'm uh, using Chat GPT, and as I mean, sometimes I think it's silly, sometimes I think it's okay, and sometimes I think it's brilliant. I'm wondering, will it in the future be different apps 
for different type of AI that we will have. So I mean, you will have them in your computer and you will use them in, in that way. So thank you. Thank you. So will we be able to measure AI and will chat GPT uh, get smarter? Yes. The first question. You see me jumping. Oh, oh. My old headmaster from the Royal Institute. I'm so happy for that question. Um, so here's the thing. We talk about superhuman uh, uh, behavior, superhuman performance. That's just an illusion. We have nothing else to benchmark with. If we want true productivity gains out of AI, we have to, we have to realize that intelligence is not one dimensional. You wouldn't say that you have a really smart squid that's almost human. It's smart, but it's smart in a different way, right? So if it's multidimensional, then we want an AI that is as different from us as we can possibly comprehend. We need to understand how to use it, but, but if we can have it very different from human intelligence, I think we're going to get more out of it. Uh, so, so that's the first question. Remind me quickly, what was the second? Because you nailed that as well. Oh, the different, yeah, the different trends, the different applications. We talk about AI today, and we talk a lot about the AI Act on the EU level. We should be focusing on the Data Act, because when we treat AI and data today, when we regulate, we tend to focus on them as products. They're not, they're services. When you use ChatGPT, you're using a service. So you have upstream and downstream uh, value added in these services. And today, you just have the data, you have the ChatGPT, and you're using it straight out. We also have some third-party applications on it. You're going to have tons of applications because if we wanted to take those administrative tasks, we need, you can't have chat GPT in a customer support. Mm -hmm. You need to filter it in some way. So, so we're going to look at da data value chains. And that I think is the future if we can get that working in the internal market. Yeah, now so I'm gonna be quiet. And just a quick add on to that. I think we want to have different application also from this value based perspective, because mm -hmm. if you, for example, compare with a newspaper, like old fashioned reference model, but you would sort of communicate, this is my frame of reference. This is from the political angle. I'm approaching this problem. Now, if we could be that transparent with chat, GPT similar solutions you could for example choose one which is I care about the environment it's important for me that all recommendation takes that into account mm -hmm. maybe all should but whatever so so it's sort of more transparent in the way this system is optimizing mm -hmm. input data that would make things clearer I think for all the users and it would make life easier so we have one question here Yes, thank you. Um, you lifted skills and uh, I'm coming from the Ministry of Employment in Sweden and I've been working for the Public Employment Services as well and I, um, information sharing and the need for data. If you want to be that it should be easy for the companies, uh, it should be easy for the workers to um, work in different countries and if you want the Swedish companies to be innovated, I, narrow AI needs so much data and often we talk about the companies that they shall have a one stop the workers should have a lot of integrity and in Sweden we talk about that the, uh, the workers should know uh, and the citizens when you use when companies or the public sector use our data in USA I think the companies own the data is data a precondition? Uh, it won't get faster than the ability to use a lot of data. So That's my question, S data. Uh, <laughs> the data. availability and use of data. Sara, would you like to take that one? Maybe you want, I, I, I think just quickly, yes, that's, that is the <laughs> issue. And I think that is also the reason why we're gonna see concentrated power among certain big technology platforms because they have that capability to source the amount of data, but also to process it because the cost of processing is so enormously high. Uh, and, and that is worrying because you, you put power in the hands of very few uh, systems and, and uh, commercial entities at this point in time. And it's worrying, I guess, that you maybe can comment on also for research because if development is pushed by these commercial platforms rather than research, it, there might be a conflict. So I'm going to be very quick because I've spoken too much. Uh, I think that 
we see we see in research on the data models prior to to large language models that you have a decreasing marginal value of adding more data so it goes like this so you want that much data but having that extra amount doesn't really account for anything uh, with large language model this seems to have changed so there's some value to be gained from from extreme scale having a lot a lot of data uh, on the other hand we also see research on generating synthetic data and on uh, doing AI that is more compute efficient and more data efficient. So we're we're shrinking those requirements. And we also saw the other week, I think it was a leak from Google, an internal email um, uh, saying that, it was a programmer saying that, look, our biggest competitor aren't the other tech giants, it's open source. Because once these these models get into the community, they're building extremely fast. And then we're back to the, the idea that there is more knowledge outside of your firm than inside. So if we combine these together, I think, yes, we're going to see a skewed market distribution for, for the really upstream top level foundation models. But you're also going to see extreme competition throughout that slope. Um, so I wouldn't be Would that- Would you like to add something? Yeah, not not an expert on this, but this seems to be an area for for regulation. So that's is, again is one of those things where we can choose: do we allow certain companies to concentrate all this power, or or not? And I think, from what I understand in the U.S., so the the U.S. has been trying uh, under under Biden uh, a more aggressive approach to antitrust uh, with respect to the big tech company companies, but not succeeding so far, as far as I understand because the antitrust law is sort of very narrow based on, oh, is it good for the consumer? And how can it be bad for the consumer if most of what these companies are providing is for free anyway at, at zero price? So I think this is just an area where regulation will, will change also with respect to intellectual property rights, because a lot of these, I mean, a lot of these, these models are trained on data that, that are out there for, for everyone actually to access. And it doesn't seem, I guess in the, in the context of individual companies, if they want to optimize their processes, it could be a bottleneck, whether they have a lot of data or not, pertaining That's to their specific processes. But in terms of, if you want to train these foundation models where the input is like the whole world, the whole internet, I think my understanding is anyway, correct me if I'm wrong, that the bottleneck is the computing power. And that is also something you could regulate, where you could say, oh, you need to, uh, uh, the, the government needs to sort of approve, I'm not saying we, we would want this, but it's something we could do, that the government needs to approve if a new giant data center is, is being built, like to, to make sure you know, what are they using it for and so on. Thank you. So we have another question here. The last question, I think, please. Thank you. Uh Brilliant panel, really interesting to listen to you. My name is Paul Lundström. I, I work for the uh, Swedish Installation Federation, and I'm thinking about AI and förvaltningspolitik, which I don't know the English word for. But uh, I see a lot of, of waste in health, education, construction sector, and if we use AI in, in, in a proper way, we could get rid of all this stupid administration that hangs around. Any thoughts on that? Yes, this is something the productivity that in, 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 as well a lot. Yeah. How how should the public sector to sort of get up to speed with the, and using AI to become more efficient? Sara, what is your recommendation? Oh, you want to start? <laughs> <laughs> I can go quick, and you can yes, say I'm wrong. Think. Okay. Uh, so I think the the asymmetry between the knowledge within the public sector and the knowledge outside of the public sector, where the technology is is an extreme problem because you have all of these rules and regulation within the private sector uh, that makes it much harder. You can't just take a couple of, of tech whiz kids and put them inside inside a government body and say, do your thing, because then, then you'll wreak havoc. Uh, we already have examples of that. Uh, so you need here you really need to bridge the gap between knowing what the tech can do and what it should be allowed to do within the public sector. So I think that that's that's the main reason the public sector is falling behind mm. that and and too much regulation perhaps on innovation. Yes, and I, I would add to that may, maybe coming back to your question that that I do think also maybe there is uh, opposite to what was said about corporations maybe there is a little bit too much of a nervousness of using these systems, 
Um, and also, uh, as you mentioned with data, I mean, there is a conflict. Like if every one of us would provide all of our health data to, to the public health sector, yes, we would have more insights, more information, better to uh, better um, decision systems to operate upon, but we don't. Uh, and, and similarly in a number of, of areas, if we all would provide our data in terms of how we move around, we could plan the city better. So I, I think what's important in Sweden is that most services show that we as people have more confidence and trust in AI than most other countries. I think that's a precious uh, situation is very, very important to keep that trust because as long as we can keep it, we can do those changes. So so in terms of, uh, I think where you started, this sort of scaremongering of, of uh, artificial intelligence, it could actually hurt us all. Mm -hmm. We need to separate the questions from each other because there are certain areas where we truly, truly, truly need this technology and maybe public sector. And I think also in terms of climate uh, transformation it, it is absolutely crucial so so there we need to be mindful of how we talk about these technologies they're not always very scary they're sometimes very very healthy and helpful thank you year i would like to give the final words to you and you can you can uh, um, continue on this path or choose another path for this uh, final remark Big responsibility. Uh, I'm not sure I understood the question about regulation, but when I think about regulation, it's uh, it's to most of us, it's a black box. And AI also at this point to most of us is a black box. So I'm not sure these things should be put together. <laughs> uh, but I think one useful reminder here is that we are talking about regulation and, and potentially introducing new regulations. And I... I I don't know if it's still the case, but I think some countries have this rule that whenever you introduce a new regulation, you have to get rid of two older ones that are probably no, no longer relevant, no longer needed. That could be useful. But uh, so simplification. Yes. That's uh, that's a uh, well, that's a good uh, concluding remark. And before I let you go, I would like to thank our speakers, Sara, Joachim, and Jorg. Uh, and also, I would like to recommend some upcoming events here at SNS. First of all, we have um, on uh, May 17th, uh, we will uh, well take a global perspective on uh, inflation and the COVID-19 recovery with economist Luca Fernaro and uh, Martin Flodien from the Riksbank and Kristina Nyman from Handelsbanken. So you're very welcome back then. And on May 26, we have a seminar that is more on related to this topic is about digitalization within healthcare. Uh, it's, a, it's a release of a report within our uh, project on these matters uh, by two economists, Björn Ekman and Lina Maria Ellegård from the university. And I see one of the commentators here in the room, Daniel Forslund. So very welcome back. And finally, I would also like to, to just uh, draw your attention to our new network program for young professionals, SNS Vision. Uh, which is not on the screen. So, but this uh, this program is uh, directed towards young ambitions and. Uh, uh people that are engaged with societal issues. So if you feel that you fit that description, you're very welcome to, to get in touch with us, or you might have a coworker that fits that description and you might uh, get in touch with us uh, from that part. And we, there also, of course, much more to read about this on our website. And Isabella is the project manager for that program and Daniel as well. So you can talk to them after the seminar. And with those words, I would like to, um, well, um, wish you all a good afternoon.